Glutentag. Imagine for a second you could extract all the knowledge from the baking pros all around the world and put that into a single video. That's exactly what this video is about. I interviewed pros from all around the world and asked them challenging questions related to sourdough baking. And this format includes the best moments, my biggest learnings. And those learnings are gonna take your sourdough baking to another level. Today, we will be focusing on two interviews. One with Kristen from Foolproof Baking. She's a master at making open crumb sourdough bread. She really is a wizard when it comes to sourdough bread. She makes the most beautiful bread there is. And second, Matthew James Duffy, also known as the Sourdough Professor. He combines bread baking with all the science behind it. Both of them have helped me so much take my sourdough bread to another level. So be prepared for some surprising tips and awesome learnings that will help you become a better baker. Many videos always advocate to use your hands for making sourdough bread. But sometimes if you're lazy you might want to be using a stand mixer. And Kristen is known for making everything by hand but sometimes she also uses a stand mixer. And I want to know exactly how to use a stand mixer when making sourdough bread. Check this out, super interesting. So um, add the liquid ingredients first. <laughs> so if you yes. put dry in and then you put wet on top, the, there's always like this dry bits on the bottom. This totally depends on your mixer, but I'm okay. using the KitchenAid Professional Series, the, the 600 model. Okay. Um, okay. Like, but the, the, if you're using high hydration dough, you can use the paddle and it really helps out a lot there. But what I'll do okay. is I'll put water, then the flour, say. And then okay. I'll kind of scoop out the dough when I add the Levon and put the Levon on underneath and then mix that. And then I'll scoop out the dough again and put the salt on the bottom. And then it just sort of picks it up as it goes around. The temperature is a super important factor when making sourdough bread. At colder temperature, everything is a little bit slower. At warmer temperature, the whole fermentation process is a little bit faster. Now check this out, what Matthew has to say on the topic of temperature. Great question. So I bought a Broad and Taylor proofer, um, in November because I had been baking panettone at the college naturally leavened every year over Christmas. And because the college was closed, I wanted to bake panettone at home. And I think it's very difficult um, for anyone that's interested in, in if you truly want, I think it's some bakers call it the Mount Everest of baking. I think it's definitely one of the most, for, in my opinion, anyways, you know, the two hardest things to do are a hand laminated croissant in a home kitchen and panettone in a home kitchen and panettone in a commercial kitchen. Like panettone is really hard. There's a lot, <laughs> there's a, it's really, it's really hard. And so I actually bought the proofer with the sole purpose of making panettone. And that was the only reason I bought it is I want to nail this recipe. I'm going to make it every single day until I'm happy with it. Um, before <laughs> that, I just used my counter. I prefer to do an overnight fermentation in the fridge. So I think that the loaves get a better shelf life. They get a better, it's easier to handle. And I also think they're better flavor. Plus for me, I mean, I'm baking upwards of anywhere from two to 20 loaves of bread out of my home kitchen in challenger bread pans. And so I can only bake two at a time. So if all of my bread's proofed on the counter and ready for the oven, I can't, you know, it might be an hour and I've got a two and a half year old, right? She's like, my daughter's almost three. Like sometimes I need to put it on hold for an hour and then come back to the bread. So I do most of my final proofing in the fridge um anything that's room temperature you know bagels the other day or the pizza dough i just do it at room temp i'm in canada so it's really cold outside i've got a front room that's very cold so i'll put the dough in the front room yesterday when things were moving too fast so we have two doors and the front room's like a mud room i actually opened the front door to my house to cool down the front room so the dough would cool down yeah I've got a, <laughs> I've, i'm sure you've done similar where you're I've got a basement that's at about 17.8 degrees in a certain corner. So I'll keep those in that corner. Um, I've got a cooling rack at the back door, which is a bit colder. And I just really play the game of, I've got a hygrometer. I can see one from where I'm sitting and there's two in my basement. And so I've got them kind of all over and I just adapt with it. And, and the, as far as the actual proofing bread goes, the only final proofing I've really done in the proofer would be panettone, a couple of babkas, and I don't know, that's about it. I don't, it okay. only, it only fits one loaf of bread and I'm always making okay. at least 10. So it doesn't really function in that way for me. Um, maybe some milk buns or something I'll proof in there, but even donuts, you know, I'm going to make, I'm not, I'm not going to just make two donuts. I'm going to make 40. So it doesn't really <laughs> function, but 
I do, I do, I have found, I must say that I've found that keeping my starter in the proofing chamber has actually been quite beneficial to both my bread and to my um, starter. I will turn it off at night so that I can do the longer, a bit colder, but during the day, like right now, my starter is at 26 degrees. That's going to go into the dough that's auto leasing. And I have found that to be much more consistent and that has been okay. a very beneficial thing. But as far as the okay. loads go, I just do it wherever. I'm also used to working at the college with like a huge proofer. You can roll the rack right in. We've got like, there's five movable proofers plus a big proofer retarder plus a big deck oven. So it's very like just trying to figure out the environment. And I found that if I want to teach people how to bake at home, using a similar environment to home is better. Whereas mm. if I'm doing everything in a Rothko oven and that's in a so proofer, true. Most people, that's very unapproachable. And if you're just a hobby weekend baker, you're not gonna go out and spend all that money on those things. When making sourdough bread, the hardest part is to nail the fermentation process. By mixing sourdough to your dough, the fermentation starts. If you ferment too short, then you won't have nice oven spring. You'll have a flat pancake. If you ferment for too long, you'll have a very, very sticky dough. How do you know exactly when your dough is done? And please check out what Kristen has to say on this topic. So these days when you bake in private, do you still use the same method or is it then mostly that you rely on sort of the look and feel of the dough? Look and feel. Look and feel, yeah, that's yeah. interesting. But it's helpful, like when I do consoles, I always tell people if they can handle it, um, find yeah. a little spice jar, cut off a little piece of your dough. That way I can at least see if the dough is rising. And by the True. way, you really have to mix that dough well. So when you when I do an aliquot, I'm sort of over mixing the dough to make sure that the salt and the levain is the same in every little corner of the dough. So when I cut it off, it's truly representative of the whole mass. So I, I did the same mistake at the start. Uh, then it would be just that either the dough or the aliquot would rise faster than the other, right? Well, it does rise faster anyway because you're not constantly degassing it and strengthening True. it, but it should rise at the same rate. As True, the makes oil. sense. That makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah, that we makes should, sense. You should be able to say something about the main dough based on the aliquot dough. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a great method, which also helped me to just see and also to everybody who just starts with baking and they don't know how ready their sourdough really is. It just helps to them to see and visualize whether there's any activity going on or not. Yeah, absolutely. In the end, after shaping your sourdough bread, you want to proof your sourdough bread. And for that, what many people like to do is to use a banneton. You place your dough inside of this banneton, then you proof it for a little while. Some people like to move their banneton into the fridge. Now, for how long can the dough stay inside of the fridge? Super interesting insights on this topic by Matthew. Check this out. I mean, another great question. So I think that it depends on many circumstances. So I would say, first of all, for anyone that's baking at home, a typical home, I'm going to talk in Celsius because I'm in Canada. I hope that's okay with you. You're you're the same, right? Uh, yes. Sorry if there's a, sorry if there's any US viewers. Sorry, but, Americans. Yeah, and I'm actually, I actually learned everything in Fahrenheit, but I've made a mental point of trying to get out of Fahrenheit because no one really uses it. So a typical, a typical home fridge is anywhere from three to four degrees Celsius. Usually it's around 3.5 degrees Celsius. And now this is a food safe zone. So anything over four degrees Celsius is considered in the danger zone. And there's a certain range of temperatures for different products, but essentially a home fridge is meant to keep your meat, your dairy, everything in it. Whereas in a bakery, you're probably looking at somewhere between eight and 10 degrees Celsius. And now it depends on the bakery, because if you have a very small bakery and you only have one fridge and you keep your bread and your dairy, you've got to keep it colder. But if you design a proper bakery and you have a fridge allocated just for your doughs, you're going to be closer to 10 degrees Celsius. And that's going to decrease your final fermentation time. Mm -hmm. You've also got in a home fridge different spots in the fridge. So the colder spot might be on the bottom. It might be warmer near the door. And so it's all case by case. I've personally found that I think that around between 12 to 18 hours for the inoculations I do and for the length of ferment I do, it seems to be my beautiful spot. When I go higher in whole grain, I go on the lower end of that and I'll do more 10 to 12 hours um, and, and higher for it. I, I don't know for sure. I don't know. This is something we should actually do a little bit of research on. I think that after a certain time, the gluten structure actually breaks down in the bread and that's why you lose that. And I think what it is, is the acidity developing in the dough. And I mean, I got another crazy baking tool. Um, I bought a pH pen 
And so it might be an interesting experiment to actually take the pH of the dough when it goes in the fridge after 10 hours, after 14 hours, after 24 hours, and see if it's actually the pH or the acidity that's breaking down the gluten structure. If I had to guess, that's what I would say, but I'm not 100% on that. And so I think if you did a very low inoculation, you could probably go on the longer end, but you're still going to develop that acidity and you're still going to start to break down at about that 24 hour point. Um, I have left breads in the oven, in the fridge for 36 hours and they baked fine. They were overly sour in my opinion, but I, I think, I think 24 hours is pushing it. I think that we should, you know, I think you need to do a video on the, 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 pH, the pH of the dough. Yeah. Oh, that, yes. that would be my guess is the pH because is breaking like, down. Because I read some papers, actually a few papers mentioned that when you're below that six degrees Celsius, there shouldn't be any additional sourness developing inside of the bread. However, many bakers are saying that the longer proofing time inside of the fridge is going to make the bread a little bit more sour. But on my personal experiments, I was not able to notice the more sour taste. The ones which I proved at room temperature had almost the same acidity inside in the end or maybe it's of course just my taste that i uh, that's not so good so i think what you mentioned taking a tool like you have yeah. and just checking the acidity that's that's the best thing it might also be a beneficial to do an experiment with just the starter and let's say feed a starter get it to its peak ripeness and then put it in the fridge and smell it because I think you'll see the expression of the acidity more in the just starter than the actual dough. So if you did, if you did both and let's say we put a loaf in, we took the pH, but also a starter and see how the pH changes of the starter as it sits in that cold environment. Oh, that's um, a great I, idea. I've heard that also that it doesn't develop acidity, but I've, so yeah, I think from personal experience, I think that definitely you do develop more acidity and, and it, it also could be if you're not developing more acidity, you're eventually running out of that food. I mean, if you take a if you take a fresh fed starter and you put that in the fridge, it does take a while, but it doesn't stay at its peak for the whole time. Eventually it'll collapse and go watery. Sure. And so it's still moving, it's just very slow. Now Kristen. Kristen really has magical hands. She knows how to make the perfect open crumb sourdough bread. That's a very, very fluffy style of bread and it's so hard to make because you really have to nail every single parameter. It's a combination of all the parameters playing together seamlessly. Super interesting insights from her. Check this out. Me personally, that bread that you just showed, <clears throat> the, the higher whole grain one. Yes, this one, right? That, that to me is a perfect crumb and it comes down to ideally having the most active, fast rising starter possible. So you get a nice fast ferment on your dough without the dough breaking down due to you know enzymatic degradation, um, and the starch is releasing too much sugar. You won't get that gumminess into the loaf, something like that. Um, and then you have flavor compounds um, from, you know, protease activity. And like, it's just, it's, it's a bunch of things. It's, it's, it's handling, right? So like handling that dough and making sure that it's given the amount of strength that it needs without going overboard and without making it too slack. So I like, you know, high hydration helps me because uh, it keeps the dough extensible. My coil folds are very strong. So mm -hmm. one coil fold imparts a lot of strength and structure into the dough. So just managing that um, bake to bake. There are stiff starters and there are more liquid starters. I want to know what's best and check out what Matthew has to say on this topic. <laughs> so this is a stiff starter that I'm using for my 100% um, whole wheat bread. And so I don't have, so again, I don't want to, I don't want to say wrong information. Um, and I'm very, I'm very careful of what I say because I, I think there's a lot of misinformation out there and there's a lot of bakers that say things like, oh, take my digital course because sourdough bread's the healthiest in the world. But do you really know that? Do you really have the evidence to prove that? Have you really, you know, yeah. a lot of people make these claims so they can sell a product. And so I'm not trying to make a claim, but I think personally that the stiffer starter is good when you're trying to develop a stronger dough. So for example, when I'm trying to get more strength into my whole wheat dough, I use a stiff starter. I also think that you're having a different balance of acid. So one thing that I really learned over the holidays with this pH pen 
um, mm -hmm. is that you can have the perfect pH for your pasta madre or for your Levin for Panettone, but it still doesn't produce the product you want. And that's because in different starters, there's a balance of acetic and lactic acids. And so I, I don't quote me on this, but I think for more, most sourdoughs, what you're looking at is about um, four parts lactic, three part, uh, one part acetic acid. Um, and with something like panettone, you want four part lactic, one part acetic, because you're trying to develop more sweet notes and the lactic will bring forth more of the sweet notes of the flour, like yogurty smell and acetic will be more vinegar. So with flavor and strength, I think are two options. So for me, the, to, to actually sort of answer that I'll use a 65% hydration when I know I need added dough strength. And when I want to sort of alter the acidity of the final flavor of the dough, hundred uh, percent whole wheat is very strong tasting. And so I can manage a little bit more acid in the dough. Um, this is definitely something that I should look more into because I don't want to say the wrong thing, but I think that that's a very good base starting point. It would be an interesting side by side to do. Mm -hmm. to say the difference in in what i found is so i work with a colleague of mine nick stacy he's a phenomenal baker we've been working together for about 10 years he's not really a social media guy but what he did was he took my recipe from my website for 100 whole wheat bread and then he started making other recipes with the same levan so this is 100 whole wheat levan and he started making his basic country and his oat porridge and he found that he was getting a better expression and more open crumb on the stiff starter versions of those breads. And now Interesting. we don't have, you know, like scientific paper behind it. We didn't do any pH testing. That's just him baking at home and sending me pictures, but it looks to both of us that he's getting a better expression of that crumb through the stiff starter. The next question is really interesting. It covers how to improve the taste of your final sourdough bread. How can you improve the sourness of your final bread? Some people like it to be a little bit tangier to improve the overall flavor. Matthew shares a few great insights on how to improve the flavor of your sourdough bread. As far as the sourness goes uh. in, in your loaf, um, I would start first of all playing around with different builds. And so over a longer period of time, we will develop a more acid, acid final product. and. You know, with speaking to one of my friends who was a baker at Tartine, they do a very young Levin and they mix it under fermented. So a lot of the books tell you to reach the, the peak and then mix your dough, whereas they're going a little bit under because they're trying to coax more sweet notes out of the bread and they're not trying to promote the sour. So if you really want to promote sour, um, I just saw a really good post from Foolproof Baking on Instagram about this, but you can do different inoculations and longer fermentations and that'll really help promote that sour flavor even when you smell a starter that's been sort of overnight um, and then i've also found that if i really want to increase the sourness in my loaf i can add whole wheat to my levin so if i'm doing 50 percent whole wheat 50 percent bread flour versus 100 percent bread flour i find i get much more acetic acid and much more sour notes in my final product okay that's very interesting yeah, actually, now that you mention it, I always only use a whole wheat or a whole rice starter. I never bake with a bread flour based starter. Um, so one of the reasons to bake with a bread flour starter, and I think this probably comes from bakeries, is it's cheaper. It's cheaper to build your, in general, not everywhere in the world and not everyone mm -hmm. has it, but in general, it's cheaper to use white flour than whole wheat flour. And so I think a lot of places use it because it's cheaper and it's easier to work with. Okay. And now going back to this question, you said you have to ferment for a little bit longer, but that also means that you need to choose a different flour, right? Because not, not every flour allows you to ferment for a very long time. In my own experiments, you would need to have a high gluten flour that allows you to ferment over a longer period of time because else it might just get sticky too fast and you won't have that sour taste. It's hard for me because I only really get higher gluten flours because of everything <laughs> I use. Even my, even the all-purpose flour that I get here is pretty strong and you could make a pretty good bread of it. I think by doing that, what you could do is decrease the inoculation. So, so if you're usually doing your bulk fermentation for about three hours, you could do it for five, but with a little bit less starter and you'll still develop those acid notes. Okay. Um, this is something that I've been planning on writing a guide for on my website. And so maybe what I'll do is a little bit more side by side and I'll really try and get that answer for, for Jules a little better. Typically all the bakers resort to just buying already ground flour. But what if you want to bake with freshly milled flour? 
There are a few gotchas, and I'm talking about them with Matthew James Duffy. And check out what he has to say on this topic. In my personal opinion, again, a lot of going back to that recipe with the rye bread where I baked it with the, the boiling water, somebody said, well, that doesn't work because you're boiling water and that recipe doesn't work. So I private messaged their, her and I said, look, why don't you why don't you try the recipe? And she said, well, I'm not trying that recipe because it's not backed by science and it doesn't work. Like, here's a picture of the bread. It works. It's very good. And, and anyways, and so with this question, this is not something, again, that I have actually, like, actual proof of but in my experiments and my trials and errors what i've found to be is not as much the the so will the larger germ or brand cut the gluten strand so first of all when i mill flour at the college it's a very large mill and i can mill it quite fine um, i can actually show you because i've got uh the flour right here and so this is the whole wheat that i'm actually working with right here mm -hmm. and so you can see it's oh, quite that's very fine very finely milled. Mm -hmm. If I squeeze that in my hand, you can see it stays as a clump and it's got good oils and, and good. And, and you don't really see those huge particles of the brand. And so when I started okay. working with fresh milled flour, I was at a bakery in Vermont called Elmore Mountain Bread. Um, they, uh, the owners are husband and wife, and he actually is the founder, creator of New American Stone Mills, which is the flour mill we have. And so I asked Andrew, you know, the same question, don't the large brand act like a knife and they cut the gluten as it's mixing? And what he told me was it's actually not the way. What really happens is those brands are actually cutting the um, air pockets or the CO2 pockets that are caused by fermentation. And so it's not the mixing that's breaking down the gluten. It's in that rising stage. Think of a bubble that's blowing up, blowing up, blowing up. And once it gets to its maximum, it's very thin. Whereas if you, uh, sorry, a balloon, if you blow up a balloon halfway, it's tough. When you blow it up all the way, it can be broke very easily. And so as it expands, 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 that's when it hits that brand and that's when it collapses. So his explanation to me was if you want to get into more higher whole grain bread such as this, you need to do a longer mix. And it comes with developing more gluten so that you can withstand that expansion and you can withstand that, that sharp point. But it's not necessarily the the germ or brand cutting the gluten strands during the mixing period. And again, I could be totally wrong on that, but that's my educated okay. guess. I would be super curious to hear what was your biggest learning, your biggest insight from the pros. Please do share it in the comment section. Thanks again, Kristen. Thanks again, Matthew. I'm going to be sharing the links in the description of this video. Happy baking as always, and may the gluten be with you. Bye-bye.